I'm going to turn it over to Eileen Rhodes, the Interim Library Director of CTC. Thank you so much, Alexa. Um, I'm so happy to be here this morning with all of you to talk about library services and resources at CT State. Um, just a little background about myself. Um, I started in the interim library director position at CT State in June of 2021. Um, prior to that, I worked at Capital Community College as a library director for about eight years. Um, and my interest in serving as interim library director really stemmed from a desire to bring more equity um amongst the 12 colleges um specifically the, the libraries and, and the resources that we all have access to so um prior to july 1st 2023 the libraries across the 12 community colleges um, had a very collaborative working relationship um, for for some time the library directors at the community college level um, worked really closely with the um, university library directors within um, CSCU, um, also Charter Oak and the Connecticut State Librarian, um, and also Patrick Carr, uh, who is the program manager for library consortium operations um, at CSCU. And that group um, is actually called the Council of Library Directors, affectionately called COLD. Um, that group meets uh, monthly and We've done a lot of work together um, as a group and, and been very successful. Um, one of the projects that um, is the real feather in our cap was the Alma Primo migration that we completed in 2018. Um, so that project came about because the university library directors um, integrated library system was basically sunsetting and we all had a product called Voyager and we decided to take the opportunity to move together onto a, the same platform so that students would experience the same um, integrated library system or the same interface if they were a community college student and then they went on to transfer to a CSU. And so the work that we did um, together on that project um, it took a couple of years. There were, there were lots of conversations and discussions around um, how to execute that particular project and everyone worked really hard to see it through to completion and it's and it's been a very successful system. Um, just so you all know, um, Alma Primo allows us to um, resource share across all um, of our institutions. So if you are a community college student, faculty or staff and you want to borrow a material from a CSU, you can do that um, via our system, our Primo system. So this was um, a really huge project and, and really let us stretch our legs on collaboration. Um, but the consolidation would require um, a whole other level of collaboration and compromise. And um, this time would not include the CSU directors, it would just be the community college library directors. So um, the prospect of consolidating the libraries, uh, frankly, was really enormous and very intimidating. Um, library services and resources are incredibly complex um, as a single library, but then digging into all the elements that need to come together to consolidate 12 separate libraries honestly felt really unachievable at times. Um, so the first step in, in this process was for the directors at the community college libraries to come together and have some much needed discussions about which elements of library services and resources we felt would benefit the students, faculty and staff at CT State when it came to the consolidation. So um, we, we asked ourselves you know, several questions, but, but the main one would be what elements would make sense to consolidate? Um, and so feeling like we needed some external perspective, um, I brought in a, a woman named Maureen Sullivan, and she is a consultant. She lives and works in Connecticut. She did work with us pro bono, so um, that was an amazing opportunity for us to work with Maureen. Um, she was a former president of ALA and has done a lot of advocacy work within libraries. Um, what really sparked me to bring her in was some outside perspective um, and also her over 30 years of library experience and especially with libraries in a transition. So um, we had several half day meetings that were in person um, at various locations across the community college campuses. 
and we just had lots of um, really comprehensive discussions about which pieces we wanted to sort of tackle with the consolidation. Um, you know, I'll be honest that it, it wasn't always um, positive and pleasant. There were some really contentious discussions about certain elements of, of library services and resources being um, consolidated. It, it felt stressful at times to, to move through this, but, um, you know, we, there were concerns raised, you know, during the conversations about retaining local autonomy to a point and not becoming so standardized that we would lose um, services and resources for our students, um, faculty and staff. So um, basically the result of the conversations um, was the um, creation of five project teams. So um, we had these five project teams, website, libguides, libanswers, e-resources and collection development that uh, were established after we had these discussions as a group. So basically what I'm gonna do today is I'm just gonna walk through each of these projects and sort of give you um, like a before and after. So um, what, what we looked like prior to um, fall 2023 or um, the, the magic date that we sort of migrated everything over was August 4th, so right before the fall start. Um, and sort of give you what, what the landscape looked like before and what it looks like now. Um, so the website team was tasked with um, creating one website for all 12 libraries. And um, prior to us going live, you know, each library had their own um, website. And in some cases it was either managed um, by the library staff or a systems librarian at that campus or it was maintained um, by a, an external webmaster or someone who was not in the library department. Um, this, this made for, you know, different scenarios to happen at different campuses. If there was a need to um, pivot quickly or add information, sometimes there was a little bit of lag if there was a, a webmaster involved, not too much, but just different when it's internally, your staff working on a website versus someone else. Um, when we first met, um, as a group, we also met with um, the vendor FastSpot, who did create the CT State website. And um, what we quickly realized in speaking with them was um, the libraries and the website in particular required a level of complexity that was very difficult um, to convey to to FastSpot. And um, you know, library websites are very robust and dynamic, and we have you know, a need to post updates if there are closings. Um, I just visited Northwestern yesterday and I, I sort of mentioned to them that they have their own little weather um, uh, group up there that basically uh, they have their own weather where their campus will close um, when the rest of the state is remain open. And so we wanted to have the ability to pivot quickly and add information to the website where needed. Um, so in this case, we we decided to work with a company called Springshare and Springshare is a very um, it's, it's a library company. They specialize in library products um, with with our needs in mind. And so their product um, called LibGuide CMS is what we decided to go with for our website. So um, we do have control over our website. We can make updates on news and events and update our resources constantly, make changes where we need to. Um, and you can see that um, on our website. So just wanted to show you all um, what the main site looks like. And when we originally met and talked, we we wanted to really have one um, website for all 12, but um, it quickly became clear that due to the complexity and the different resources and services and availability of different things at each campus, it really didn't make sense for us to just have one website. So we do, um, we are hosted on one platform, on one LibGuide CMS, we're all connected, um, but, but you can enter into your specific campus from this page and get to exactly what you need. Um, one of the biggest pieces of this is the book collection. So our physical collections, books, journals, and magazines are different at each campus. And we wanted to make sure that if a student was searching within one campus library, that they, they knew that that material would be available at that specific location. So I thought I would just walk through um, a couple 
instances, I just pulled a couple random screenshots from from the different library um, home pages. So if on that for on that previous slide, if I were to click on Northwestern, this is where I would land. So the Northwestern um, library has a, a basic search box in the center, as do all of our libraries. Um, we we settled upon a design that was similar um, in look and feel across the twelve, but that the um, specific elements of the site could be um, edited and changed to suit the local needs of the campus. So um, along the top, you can see um, above the search bar, there's research guides, databases, um, Northwestern archives and about the library, the different tabs that run, run along the top. Those are different dependent on which campus you would visit um, based upon which areas are clicked on most and what services and resources those individuals at that campus would require to um, take a look at. And then underneath, you'll also see the, the circular icons. Those are also a similar um, style of, of each website, and those are different also depending on, on the needs of the campus. So here's um, the Tunxis site. So you can see it's um, just a, a little bit different, um, but very similar. And then I also have Naugatuck Valley here, um, so you can see they also have a main search box um, and then the, the circular icons underneath. So I, I wanted to, to take a moment um, today to really give kudos to the library team and um, specifically mention these folks that served on each of these teams because um, I really have to say that we have a phenomenal library team across all 12 campuses. Um, these library staff worked tirelessly to make sure that everything was in place by fall for faculty and students. Um, many of us felt like we 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 didn't have a lot of time for vacation this summer because there was so much to do. Um, the website team really did a phenomenal job um, in looking at different um, sample sites and similar consolidated library sites to really find out which features we liked and what we didn't like and to create the ultimate design that that you all are interacting with um, today. So looking towards the future, um, we we do want to do some usability testing. We did not have time to do that this summer, um, which basically we, we want to make sure that the websites are being utilized in the way that we anticipate them to be. And so we, we will be doing that work um, over the next year or so, just to make sure that our websites are, are functioning the way that, um, the best way possible for our students, faculty and staff. So I'm going to move on to um, the LibGuides team and um, specifically the work that they did, but we'll we'll do sort of a before picture of, of LibGuides. So um, we had, you know, 12 separate LibGuides instances across the 12 libraries. Um, they were all on separate platforms. Um, some campuses have had what's called the CMS version, and um, the CMS version has some added functionality. Um, including the management of guides into groups. And that's what we have currently. Um, we, we decided to go with LibGuide CMS, so we had um, all the functionality that we needed to um, have 12 sort of um, sites on, on one platform. And the CMS version also allows for some customizations that the regular one doesn't. Um, we did have a desire to be on the same platform. Um, there, Everyone was sort of doing their own thing um, in a way. Um, I, I do want to just quickly mention in case folks aren't familiar with with what a research guide is. Um, it's basically a guide that can support uh, any faculty need, any curricular need. So um, essentially we, we create knowledge and information and organize resources and feature different websites on the research guide that can support either a specific course um, or you know, a topic that is of interest. And so um, having the ability to take a look at these um, as one was, was really important to us. So um, on August 4th, uh, 2023, we migrated um, all of the library's research guides into one platform officially. Um, that didn't just happen magically on that day, but there was a lot of work done behind the scenes. Um, 
some of which was research guide cleanup. So many of the librarians across the campuses took a look at their existing libguides and if there were, you know, half built ones or ones that weren't used as often, those those were um, eliminated so that we could move over our guides in a, in a really clean way. Um, I do want to say that the libguides team, there was a team that worked on some centralized citation guides, which we hope to do more of in support of CT State. Um, so they decided to start with um, the MLA and APA citation guides because that is um, similar across all. Um, it's a standardized format that we all need to know and our students need to know and many of our English faculty teach. Um, and so we wanted to make sure that uh, those guides were pretty standardized across the board. When we create guides like that and they're standardized, um, it gives us the ability to create um, you know, in-house instruction tutorials um, that we can then share across campuses. So um, this, this was a huge undertaking and um, just a wonderful outcome. So here's a, just a screenshot of the APA guide. So um, one of the things that the LibGuides team was they looked at um, best practices and basically the, the format um, of the guides. And so you can see here how everything is separated on the left hand side. There's that clickable menu that you can um, enter into the different areas. And so you can utilize this um, guide and the MLA guide as a faculty or student um, to help support any questions that you have, because I know we, we usually get a lot of questions about citations from students. Um, I just wanted to show um, sort of the difference. Norwalk has um, their guides organized by subject, and you can see um, here it's an alphabetical list. Um, and then Three Rivers has theirs listed here as well um, in, in a little bit of a different manner, but you can see the different topics that could potentially be covered um, by having a LibGuide. And so I just wanna give again, kudos to the LibGuides team. All their names are up here. Um, th these folks worked so hard on migrating all of this content and making sure that it um, looked okay on the on the back end and that everything was organized in a way that would make sense for everyone to be able to utilize um, for this fall semester. So thank you, thank you, thank you for the LibGuides team hard work. Okay, so now we're going to move into LibAnswers and um, we LibAnswers is is the virtual chat. So um, some folks had the virtual chat at their campuses and some didn't. So um, when I was at Capital Community College um, and we went into COVID lockdown, um, we did not have any access to virtual chat. So our students um, could not um, interact with us at all um, when we were all virtual. And so I actually worked with um, Jim Patterson from Northwestern and Matt Hall, who was at Esnantuck at the time, to go in together on a shared instance of LibAnswers. Um, we decided to do that for a couple of reasons. One, we thought um, it was a monetary benefit to maybe have a little bit of cost savings for us to share um, one LibAnswers instance. And then the other reason behind it was we thought it might be a good way to um, see if a shared instance might work for us. Um, and so we went in together on um, Live Answers, and what we noticed a couple of things. The first thing we noticed was that the majority of the questions that came in from students were were general in nature. So, um, asking about um, availability of hours, um, if they could check out a laptop, um, if you know they could get some help on a research topic or um, help with a specific database, um, citation help. But we also noticed that when we would help a student with their e-resource needs or they had a specific database they needed to access for a class, um, we couldn't necessarily access each other's databases from one campus to the other. So that was one barrier that um, I'm going to address later in this presentation that, that's been removed um, because of our centralized e-resources package. But that those were just a couple of observations that we made um, as a group when we rolled this out to to sort of the the beta test of the three campuses. So um, this again 
to me was was an inequity because there were some campuses and some students and faculty that had this service and then some that didn't. And um, it, it seemed to make sense to move to one instance of LibAnswers so we, we could all kind of cover chat together. So what it looks like now um, is we have one chat interface staffed by all library staff across um, all 12 campuses. So this um, really allows us to um, have backup. So if someone has a class or someone is sitting at the desk and a student comes up and needs help and um, the librarian gets up to help that student and they're not seated right in front of the computer at that moment, there is someone else um, on the back end who's also monitoring the chat. And so those questions can be picked up by students. Um, so what, what we decided to do for fall, um, because we were kind of, we were starting from a place where we didn't really have a lot of information about how this would function. Um, we decided to split the campuses in half. So we have six campuses covering Monday, Wednesday, Friday, and then um, six campuses covering Tuesday, Thursday, Saturday, dependent on hours. Um, some folks are not open on Saturdays. Um, but you can see the, the hours of the chat that we're generally trying to staff with a live librarian or multiple librarians staffing that chat. And I also wanted to be sure that I included the text librarian phone number in there because um, if a student needs help and they don't have access to a computer necessarily, or they're not going to be interacting with um, the chat uh, with us um, widget that pops up on all of our pages, they can text um, immediately and, and get someone to assist them. Um, the, the biggest thing about LibAnswers is because we had never done this before as one unit, um, we're sort of learning as we're going a little bit. It's It's been working out really well so far. Um, we, we are probably going to take some time in the winter session to do some um, data collection and take a look at um, if we need to do any tweaking on the number of folks that are staffing at the same time. Um, we have had over 200 chat sessions um, so far since we, we launched in August. Um, I anticipate that this will just increase over time. Um, and we we can, what's really nice about the LibAnswers platform is that there are a lot of robust, robust ways to collect data. And so we will be able to see, um, you know, how often chats are missed if we have to extend the hours or we have to change um, how we're doing things internally. So um, just to kind of lift the hood a little bit, um, this is an internal guide, um, LibGuide that, that the library staff has access to, and um, it's essentially a best practices guide. And so the LibAnswers team um, that did this project work created um, this um, guide for library staff. And so um, we included the schedule and um, essentially a guide to LibAnswers for our library staff. Again, I want to um, publicly thank the Lib Answers team for all of their hard work. Um, like I said, this team will continue to meet and um, tweak as needed. Um, and since this is our first full semester with this product in the way that we're using it, um, we're, we're going to see how things continue to progress. Okay, so. Um, Prior to the consolidation this summer, um, like, I, like I've mentioned, the libraries have always operated really independently. And this was certainly the case for our e-resources. So when I say e-resources, I mean e-books, databases, um, online newspapers, things like that. So um, each because each of the 12 campus libraries had different e-resources, like I mentioned earlier, when I was talking about LibAnswers and um, us trying to cover for each other and not having access to each other's um, resources. This this was something that that the directors had lengthy conversations about, and we felt like this was really foundational to a lot of what, what the work that we do in the libraries and the support that we can provide on um, faculty and students at CT State. So um, I just want to tell a little story about um, when I worked at. Capital Community College as the library director, um, there were many times where a faculty member would see a demo of 
a particular database or resource, and then they would come to me and ask if I could purchase it. And many times I just didn't have the money in my budget to purchase um, the particular database that they were inquiring about. Um, this was a point of frustration for me because I, I knew that others in the system had access to it and it, I just felt like it shouldn't be that way that that all the faculty should be able to access um, similar e resources, high quality and, and um, lots of them. So um, this, this, you know, played out many times and um, what we decided as directors was that we were going to endeavor to have a centralized package for e-resources. So the first team, the first thing that the e-resources team did um, was an audit of all the databases that were currently being purchased at all of the libraries across the community colleges. So um, basically the team created really a massive spreadsheet and just did an inventory of which databases were being purchased where. Um, from there, um, we decided to do um, what's called the RFQ process or request for quotation process. So the e-resources team created a document, um, the RFQ that was sent out to um, all the different vendors that we um, had had business with previously from the, the massive spreadsheet that I mentioned. And so we, we sent the RFQ document out to all of the, the different vendors requesting for um, them to give us a quote for you know, our, our FTE at CT State. Um, and then the e-resources team would then evaluate all of the quotations or the, the um, responses to the RFQ that came in to, to make the best decision possible for our resources. Um, so the next piece of the process was to get feedback from faculty and also from library staff and librarians um, via survey. So we sent out a survey. Um, I know I sent out a few uh, CT statewide emails about this particular process. Um, I believe we had the survey open for around a month and we basically were just seeking feedback from um, faculty, especially in specific disciplines about different resources that we had available and if they liked them or if they did not. Um, and also any information that they could provide around um, why they thought one was a better decision over another. So um, once we received all of the survey feedback, um, we um, basically uh, just we had to make our, our selections. And so then we, um, after the data was collected, and I should mention, we, we collected data from over 700 people across CT State. So over 700 people participated in that survey. And um, the survey data was taken into consideration along with the RFQ responses. And then we conducted a comparative analysis of similar products. Um, an example would be Visible Body, Anatomy TV, and Gale Interactive Human Anatomy. Those three products are similar. Um, they serve a similar purpose, and so we did sort of a, a comparative analysis or a comp of those three based upon the survey feedback, um, the pricing, and some of the other elements of the RFQ um, technical configurations and things of that sort. So um, once all of that was done, um, the e-resources team made their selections or their recommendations to the directors of the centralized e-package that we would um, that we were suggesting to approve. Um, and so what ended up happening was um, the vendors that were selected were contacted um, by me and we um, entered into an agreement process. So that was a very lengthy process, um, which would require me to work with um, Amy Horn, who's in procurement at CSU and also Patrick Carr um, at CSU to go through the agreements and make sure that they were fully compliant for the state of Connecticut. Um, so this is all the work that we we did, um, you know, since really 2022 and, and this summer proved to be a very busy summer in doing all of this work and getting all of these agreements executed. But um, I can say successfully that we, we did uh, execute all the agreements and 
we got all of the access to the different databases. I will say some of them came right down to the wire just because there was so much um, work to do within the agreements to make sure that they were fully compliant. And in some cases, there was a lot of back and forth with the vendor to make sure that um, everything was in order. So um, I, I wanted to sort of also kind of lift the hood a little bit and show you all um, basically the technical configurations um, tracking sheet that was created by the e-resources team. So um, when the um, when the agreements were executed and the vendors granted us access, we, we needed to do internal and external testing to make sure that the database and resources could be accessed um, both, both on and off campus seamlessly. So um, basically a subset of the e-resources team who has a keen expertise in technical configurations created um, this CTC e-resources project planner um, in Excel to track the status of each database and the different pieces that needed to be checked and verified, um, including you know, administrative credentials, the agreement, the IP ranges, um, easy proxy configuration, and, and others. So um, this was, as you can probably tell, a massive undertaking to make sure that every single database worked as it should, and that when a faculty or student clicks on something that they can access it, whether they be on campus or off campus. So um, with all of this work completed in the last two years, we now have a centralized package um, that you all have access to now. And so I thought I would just kind of walk through um, the package with you. And if you have questions, um, more specific questions about any element of the package or any database that you're keenly interested in, please reach out to your local library staff. Um, they are equipped to help you, but I will say one caveat because this is a very large package and there's a lot of new content. Um, just give some grace and patience to the library staff because they're working really hard to make sure that they become as expert as they can in, in many of these um, new resources. So. Um, I know there's a lot of words on this slide, um, but I just kind of want to go through. We we do have a, a very, very robust package that um, I feel supports the curricular needs of CT State um, in, a, in a really complete way. So we have the DSM-5 um, prior to us consolidating, consolidating and becoming centralized um, with this package. I, I don't. I think we maybe had two campuses that had access to DSM-5 and, and now we all do. Um, we contracted with EBSCO for a package um, of their different databases. So you can see the list here, um, very, very numerous, lots of different specific um, subject areas, criminal justice, um, ERIC. We have psych info and psych articles. Um, Psych Articles was a product that we used to have access to via the Connecticut State Library, but due to a cut that they sustained several years ago, we didn't have access to it. So now we've brought it back um, through this this package, which is is wonderful. Um, there are ebooks included in this package as well. Um, we also have the Gale package, um, and the the Gale products. There are, are quite a few. Um, the Gale Interactive Chemistry and Human Anatomy. Um, is something that I hope a lot of our um, allied health and our, our health folks use nursing. Um, I think it would be really, really beneficial to, to you and your students. We have business insights, um, of course, opposing viewpoints and um, the, the various history databases, global issues. Um, we also were able to procure the Literature um, Resource Center and the Gale Literary Criticism Online for a very, very competitive price. Um, so that those two um, databases in particular have been very expensive in some cases. And I, I do also want to mention that what was interesting about this process working with the vendors and, and requesting the RFQ was when we looked at what libraries were paying for certain databases, um, there was wild discrepancy between um, from campus to campus. So some campuses would be paying, you know, twenty thousand dollars for a database, and some would be paying ten. Um, so it was 
um, a, a good thing for us to do that type of audit and then also see what kind of pricing that they were going to quote us so that we, we wouldn't overspend. So um, a couple of others here, we have the ICE video library, which is um, streaming video collections, um, which feature real life patients and therapists, um, also in the health field. We have Infobase, which um, most folks are aware of because of Films on Demand. So we have Films on Demand for all campuses. Those are streaming films um, with lots of different topics. African-American history, Bloom's literature, Credo academic core, and then um, this sort of the, the sister to opposing viewpoints, um, which is issues and controversies. So we do have both of those databases, which were heavily used on many of the campuses. Um, I'm also really excited about the JSTOR art store suite, which um, I could never get a capital and now we have for everyone. Um, it's a very robust um, database with lots of different um, disciplines featured and um, I, I'm really hoping that that folks are enjoying this particular uh, suite. And um, the list keeps going. So we have Canopy, which is um, a streaming film service. Um, those films are unlimited streaming, so um, you can feel free to, you know, assign a film to a student. Um, you can put it in Blackboard, um, uh, and there's there's really no limit to the number of of times you view those films. Um, also, MLA Handbook Plus, which is a fantastic resource for for those um, students really needing help with MLA. New York Times Online, um, which uh, we we spoke about a lot during the CFT yesterday at Northwestern. Um, you can sign up for New York Times Online with your um, CTC email, and you can access all of their content. We also have access to New York Times Cooking. Um, so that was another piece that that is really helpful for those in the hospitality um, field and culinary. Uh, we also have an Oxford package, so the Oxford English Dictionary, uh, Grove Art, Grove Music, American National Biography, Very Short Introductions, and African American Studies Center. Um, also Overdrive, which is um, ebooks and audiobooks, which features um, Libby. Some of you might use Libby with your public library, so um, that's a, a really great product that um, I think a resource that only one campus had previously, and now all 12 of us have. We have the ProQuest um, College Complete eBook collection, and then a product called Sage Explorer, which um, is new to, to most of us, but the products and the resources included in the Sage Explorer module were very, very well received across the campuses. Um, CQ Researcher is one of the resources that many librarians are familiar with, but they also have um, some different SAGE skills modules. Um, one has some really great information literacy information, so we are excited to be able to integrate some of those components um, to offer information literacy instruction to, to you in your classes. Statista, um, which includes statistic statistical information and reports, um, consumer and company um, information as well, uh, also heavily used, but that was another database that was only available at, at a couple of our campuses, and now we have access um, for, for everyone. Uh, Swink Digital Campus is also a streaming film um, company, but in the case of Swank, um, because a lot of the content is more of like the Hollywood films, um, some of them blockbusters, there's a little bit of a limitation on the number of titles that we can stream. Um, please check with your local librarians um, or library director on, on if you're interested in, in streaming films from Swank. We also have access to Wall Street Journal online. Um, and I should mention that that Wall Street Journal and New York Times are very similar in that you can register using your um, CT State email and choosing a password, and then you have full access um, to those resources. And then lastly, we do have access to Westlaw. Um, we set up Westlaw to be available for paralegal faculty and students only at this time. Um, it is a very expensive database. Law 
law um, content tends to be very expensive, but we um, will take a look and see how the usage is and, and see if we need to adjust in, in the next fiscal cycle. So um, that is the package. Um, it's it's incredibly impressive um, that, that you all have access to all of these different um, databases. And I know that for many campuses, it was a, a, a vast increase in the number of resources that are available, which I, I think is fantastic. So I did wanna just um, highlight the um, A to Z list that is featured on our website. So this was um, work that the e-resources team did um, to set up basically a, a, a very large list of all the different databases that we have available um, in the centralized package. And you can see that you can drill down by subject. So if, if you're a faculty member and you wanna see what types of databases are within your discipline, you can drill down to the subject. Um, you can also search by database type, um, vendor. Uh, the vendor piece might be more beneficial for, for librarians, um, but there's just multiple ways that you can take a look at all the different content that we have available. I did wanna mention that um, the majority of the resources and everything that I showed you on the previous slides is included in the centralized package and everyone can access all of those um, resources, but there are still some local, very specific databases that are being utilized on the campuses, anywhere from one to five. There's not a lot, but um, if there was a particular program or a very specific need at a campus, we tried to retain those databases at the local level. So if you didn't see something that you think you should have access to, please again, reach out to your library staff because you might still have access to, you just, it's just not included in our centralized package. So one of the questions that comes up frequently is, well, how much money uh, did you save in, in taking a look at this centralized package and, and um, doing the RFQ process. And um, we uh, basically did a breakdown of, of what it would cost. So um, I, I mentioned that some of the vendors were charging different um, amounts to differ, different campuses, which was, was kind of challenging. But I, I do feel like the way that the e-resources team approached the goal of centralizing the e-package was essentially to create a, a competition between the vendors. So it was sort of like um, encouraging them to give their best offer to CT State. And so um, with all that being said, if we were to pay for this e-resources package that I just shared with you, the centralized package for the individual campuses, we would have paid over $2,425,000. Um, what we're actually paying is in the center there, the 906,000 plus. So the total savings um, going with a centralized package for the libraries of CT State was over $1.5 million, which is extremely significant and a huge um, feather in our cap for the libraries to be able to save that amount of money for um, CT State in general. So uh, I would be remiss not to give sincere thanks to the e-resources team. Um, this team worked so hard. Every team, every project team worked so hard this summer to see all of these projects to fruition. Um, and uh, the, the complexity that was involved with looking at everything that we had from all the 12 libraries to then um, drilling down to what we wanted to pursue um, using the RFQ and um, running the survey, looking at comps, um, you know, looking at all that data to make make the decision. This this was a, a huge undertaking and, and the technical um, configuration and expertise that many of our library staff possess is, is really, inspiring and, and amazing um, to get all of these resources up and running for fall um, what was was truly incredible. So I just want to thank this group publicly for their hard work on this particular project. So I do have um, the the last project team, which which I mentioned in my list um, is the collection development team and the collection development team um, started their work um, and 
uh, essentially we we took hiatus because it, it became very um, evident that a lot of the work um, that was being done in the other projects would have to sort of come first. And it was so much work involved in those four projects that we decided to just sort of take a time out on the collection development team. Um, they are going to be coming back together to do some work. Um, basically, their main goal is to look at physical library collections, so books, journals, and magazines more holistically. So instead of looking at their collections as individual, 12 individual collections, we're going to be looking at our collection as one. Um, and basically, this team did an internal survey of existing collection development practices across the 12 libraries, and then also conducted an external um, data gathering in the form of interviews from some of our library peers. So many of them were consolidated, some weren't, but um, this team will resume um, soon now that some of our other projects have, have um, come to fruition. But I also wanted to publicly thank this team for the work that they've done and that they will continue to do um, moving forward. So um, basically to, to uh, get into some of the future plans for the, for the libraries, um, like I said, we've been very busy and, and I think everyone deserves a little breather um, after all the project work that we've completed. But like I mentioned, um, the collection development team will continue to work and uh, potentially create uh, you know, a, a policy around collection development. Um, we also have a product from Springshare called LibInsight, which is um, comprehensive data. Um, there, you can create data sets. And so we've, we've been sort of testing out the um, data set widget that um, librarians and library staff can fill in all the usage stats that they have in their libraries. And this really is going to help us with the iPads and the ACRL surveys that we're required to fill out, which require lots of data collection. It will also help inform us um, of the usage of our campus libraries and, and any other piece of information that we want to kind of track for assessment purposes. Um, we will probably be developing more shared or centralized guides like the citation guide. Um, I think there, there's an interest in, in doing that and pursuing that for, for CT State. Um, the CCS 1001 course, um, we are embedded in that course. Information literacy is, is an embedded gen ed competency. And so um, many instruction librarians are working with faculty who are teaching that course to um, make sure that that information literacy competency is being um, explored. And we, we have had a team of instruction librarians that have been meeting and they actually created um, a tutorial with a product called LibWizard, which is also a SpringShare product that we have access to to support the curriculum. And then I just wanted to mention two um, things that are sort of very much in, in a draft form, but because we are working with one centralized e-resources collection and we have one website now and many of our platforms are, are centralized, um, we're, we're going to be taking a look at the systems librarians and potentially um, divvying up different vendors and products among the systems librarians to make sure that everything is um, being organized in a way that it can be maintained and everyone sort of knows what their role is. We're also exploring the idea of um, subject area liaison librarians for um, the different schools of CT State. And we're hoping that um, if we can build a, a, st a structure within our staff around the different subject areas that those librarians can work together on tutorials and um, different collaborative projects and that they can also participate in curriculum meetings. So when there is um, a new program being pitched or um, a curriculum need that requires a library resource or library instruction that those librarians are at the table for those conversations. So um, I'm just going to close. Um, this is my my one of my last slides, but I, I just wanted to take the opportunity today to sincerely thank the library team across the 12 campuses for their hard work, patience and consideration towards one another. Um, I really, their work has been inspiring through this process and it's been my pleasure to lead them through through this um, very complex um, and sometimes a scary process to consolidate um, 
everything, you know, there's been so much uncertainty and complexity around it that it, it it's been um, a, a real challenge, but, but also I, I feel extremely lucky to have had all of these projects come to fruition in the way that they have and to be able to give access to all of our faculty, um, students and staff across all of CT State. So um, I, I just want to reiterate again that there is so much new um, in the library that um, please again extend some grace and patience to your library staff. They are working so hard um, and they want to be the best support possible for you. Um, and we, we are doing lots of training um, to get as up to speed as we can on all of these fantastic resources that you and your students will have access to. So um, with that, I am going to close and open it up for any questions that you all may have. <laughs> so I haven't seen any questions come in. So this is your chance if you do have something that you're dying to ask Eileen. Um, so from my perspective, that means you put on a great presentation that was incredibly informative. <laughs> <laughs> it was pretty comprehensive. I went a little longer than I thought, but that's okay. <laughs> it's oh, a lot of information. <laughs> Fantastic. So if you have any questions, now's the time to put them in the chat. Um, we'll give everyone one more minute, but thank you so much, Eileen, for coming and sharing all that information. I know I learned a whole bunch of things that I didn't know. So that's great. Yeah. I would like to say a, a heartfelt thank you to the library team um, under Eileen's leadership and thank you to Eileen. Um, this took a team effort and I know the lift that it took for this entire team. And I just wanted to say thank you for all the work that you have all done. Um, I don't think people realize the savings of 1.5 million dollars and that shows the work that you did and how you rode together as a team outstanding and thank you for all your work. Thank you, Tim. Thank you so much. And so it doesn't look like there's any questions coming in. So okay. I just want to say thank you one more time and I'm going to end the presentation. I hope everyone has a lovely day. Thank you so much, everyone. Enjoy your day. Bye. Bye. -bye. <laughs>